Army was there when you left. Distinguished veterans, those that are, I don't think we have any here that are active duty, military, reserve, but if we did, and ladies and gentlemen, as said, my name is Steve Zaley. I'm the author of the book, They Are Only Gone If They Are Forgotten. About the original members of the 505 Combat Team at inception in 1942, the demobilization of high-time combat forces at the end of the Second World War. Before we go into our presentation, I would like to uh, say thank you to Michael Bazinet, the Veterans Military Museum of the Carolinas, and Transylvania County Library for sponsoring this presentation. Everybody, we need to remember our museums, and we all have wills. We could always <laughs> put a little bit aside for a museum. Something that will take place and take the memories and take the trials and tribulations of what our military has gone through and bring it to format. Now, I would like to get into our presentation. The book took 20 years to produce. I had a contract with the United States Army, the 82nd Airborne Division and Provisional Parachute Group, Fort Benning, Georgia, to produce this. And we did have a situation that I ended up contacting the lead attorney for the United States Army, the Director of Copyright and Licensing, when there was a problem that there was not to get into a long dissertation about it, but the unit emblem was released to me for use on and in the book. And the, uh, the authorizing authority didn't have authorizing authority, which led me to have to go find the uh, lead attorney for the Army, but the, every caption in the book is that the book has been accepted and approved by the Director of Copyright and License of the United States Army. You won't see that in hardly any books out there. Now, World War I, the war that would end all wars. They fought in the trenches, and the one different thing about World War I was it was the first time that chemical warfare was used, and it was the first war where it started to become mechanized. You can see these men are wearing gas masks, they have the 06 Springfield rifles with the 16-inch bayonet mounted on the bug. You can see the scabbard for that 16-inch bayonet. They said the reason for that was in contact with your opponent. Before he would be able to get, grab the barrel of the gun, you would be able to strike. That was the reason for the long bayonet. The gas mask for phosgene and mustard gas and I still remember when I was a little kid in my parents' business, some of the old timers from World War I coming in there, and you could still see the burns on their faces and their hands from phosgene and mustard gas. It was highly deadly. The 82nd fought in World War I. They were not an, they were not an airborne unit, they were infantry. They were highly victorious. They produced the first Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, who was Sergeant Alvin York. He was a God-fearing, church-going man who did not believe in, in killing. War had changed him to where when he saw what was happening to his friends in combat, he became very, very vicious. On the 11th month, the 11th hour, the 11th day of 1918, the armistice was signed, the Treaty of Versailles, which would end the hostilities in World War I, and the 82nd Infantry would come home, along with all the other units that were fighting. The 82nd, when they came back, the United States and got off the ship in New York, there were two commodities that would never see war action in World War I, which was the 101st Screaming Eagles Infantry and the fully automatic Thompson submachine gun, which would take the notoriety of, 
a back alley sweeper with the Elliott Ness era, and a trench broom by the military. The world went and slept in peace and harmony for about 23, 24 years. Germany started to become very active again, started moving into Poland, taking parts of Europe. It was obvious we were going to get drugged into the war. We turned and started to look at a new type of way to produce men into combat rapidly. It was termed vertical envelopment, or what would become paratroopers. So after a series of provisional parachute group in Fort Benning, Georgia, turning out these paratroopers in drips and drags, the 82nd was brought back from demobilization. And they had 14,000 men that were in the 82nd. They proclaimed them an airborne unit. They had half the men jump the fence and go AWOL. They weren't paratroopers. They weren't going to be paratroopers. And nobody was going to make them jump out of an airplane. So all 14,000 were moved out. And they started to bring paratroopers from provisional parachute group into the 82nd, and they were staffing it up and building it up. They turned around, and the in the book is the official uh, documents and records and after action reports and general orders and all of that stuff is in the book. The actual general orders splitting the 82nd in half, because they said, we want to have two airborne units. So they split them in half. They said, this half remains the 82nd Airborne Division. This half is going to become the 101st Screaming Eagles. And that's where your Band of Brothers started to come from. Now, those of you that saw Band of Brothers, they were under the command of General William Lee, who was the father of Provisional Parachute Group and the father and proclaimed the father of Airborne. So, General Lee then left Provisional Parachute Group and took up the 101st in command of them. And they were being groomed to be the first to go into the war. But they didn't plan on a colonel who had the name of James Gavin. And we're going to talk about him in a little bit. This is PLF training, Parachute Landing Fall. And this is how to take vertical inertia and break a vertical descent into forward motion, hopefully without breaking anything. <laughs> this, you can see this man is hanging, and on the right-hand side, you can see there are two guide wires going up. What they're going to do is they're going to drop him, and it's going to simulate landing. Now, the parachutes that were used in combat were T-5s. They had a descent rate of 24 feet a second. Their body weight couldn't be over 170 pounds. When my father went out the door, he weighed over 350. It was all equipment, explosives, parachute, ammunition, composition, deep plastic explosives, white phosphorus, plastic, white phosphorus grenades, fragmentation grenades, Primer cord, six wraps around the pole, base of the telephone pole, would snap it in half three times that much, would launch the pole 20 feet in the air. And then when they took off, they were all sitting there smoking. Go figure that one out. This was the ducted fan. This fan was connected to a large V8 engine and a large propeller ducted. And what they did was this was, you had to demonstrate you could collapse the parachute after being drugged, face up, face down, legs tangled up in risers, they would do anything they could do to try to get you to quit. And this was part of the training. And in this slide, you can see the skid mark. You had to collapse that parachute within 100 feet. These were the 250 foot towers. They're still in use today. There's talk that they may end up not using them anymore. They're just going, we're starting to get streamlined and to the point where they're not using the towers to simulate the landing. And I was at Fort Benning and actually saw a demonstration where a man was 
at the top of this 250 foot parachute and they talked about what happens when things go wrong and they dropped him. He had a reserve parachute but the main canopy was not open. He dropped in five seconds. He deployed the parachute and was on the ground. And from where I was standing, which was a good distance away, he looked like he hit hard. But it was a demonstration to show what happens when things go wrong. Now, this man back here, that is the real Benjamin Vandervoort. He was portrayed by John Wayne in the movie The Longest Day. What every one of these guys complained about The Longest Day, they said all these guys portraying us are twice our age. Now, Vandervoort, just as an interesting piece of information, in the Battle of the Bulge, after four combat jumps and everything he went through, he was hitting the eye with a piece of shrapnel, his military career ended. At 73 years old, he was in a nursing home and he had his dog with him, and he was up a flight of stairs. His dog got between his legs, he tripped, and that was the end of Major Vandervoort's life. After everything he'd been through, it's unbelievable that that's how he went out. Now, these prospective candidates are going to get ready to go on a training jump, and what you'll notice about the plane is, the plane doesn't have, it's not, it's all a drab combat readiness. It still has its features from civilian life because the planes were acquired from Pan Am. We didn't have enough planes to go into combat. So we acquired the airplanes from Pan Am. These candidates, you can see they're wearing phenolic helmets. They're getting ready to go on a training jump. And this man laying down is looking out the door to signify when they're, when they're going to go, when uh, they're over the drop zone. You can see the static line wrapped back across the parachute here. The edges are held with rubber bands. They're still done that way today because what it does is it holds them in place so that as the man leaves the airplane, you can see the static line is starting to stretch. This is called the tense moment. And you can see in this picture the static line running back up into the airplane, but very uniformly deployed. Now, this, you can see this man is almost laying flat or almost upside down. And one thing they say is when those, when those steel rings come out that hold these suspension lines, when they come out of that backpack, they come out with a vengeance. And that is very bad body position going out the door of the airplane. This is perfect body position. You can see the static line is doing its job. He's in descent. The static line is gonna tear the backpack off of the parachute. The parachute's gonna unfold and it goes and blossoms to the full canopy within nine seconds. That's a wild ride right there. The canopies were 28 feet in diameter, and you can see each, each one has a number and a, rip, and a serial number, and they were, they were actually sewn in a manner, you can see here, that was called ripstop, so that if they blew a panel which you could blow up to seven panels in combat, nine panels in training, and not have to throw the reserve. Because these were designed that if, if you did blow a panel, it would not rip the whole panel. It would only rip a portion. And the parachutes, the original white ones, were silk. Not every landing is a good one. And what a lot everybody feared more than landing in a tree was a water landing. I think the caption on this one says it all. It's rough, but perfect. Now you can see here, these parachutes, these are actually, the dark ones are actually camouflage, and they were made out of a man-made material that just was released called nylon where you can see these up here are white, but this is also a problem because that's the equipment. And 
The one thing the paratroopers didn't want was having the equipment come down on top of them. Because you have four belt fed 19, 19 Browning, uh, or correction, 1911 Browning belt fed machine guns in a para pack and they land on top of you, it's going to hurt. This I always usually include in a presentation. This man was on a training jump. He, took, he was hit by the airplane behind him and took off seven feet of the outboard wing and about broke every bone in his body. He convalesced and he did return to parachute duty, although he never did go overseas into combat. Their parachute jump wings at that time were made of sterling silver. Those men you saw going ashore in the landing craft, Omaha Beach, my father-in-law, Utah Beach versus Salt Wave, they were paid $21.50 a month. If you could get through the parachute training, you got $50 on top of $21.50 a month. That was some pretty big money in 1942. And officers got $100 on top of 21.50. This was their parachute emblem that was on their hats, their jackets, their clothes, signifying that they were airborne. This was the 505 combat team's first parachute emblem. And it was designed by General, by Colonel Gavin. The Panther with the crest the model ready. They submitted it to the Office of Heraldry, and the Office of Heraldry rejected them from having this unit model because they had no history. So the unit model was not approved until 1946, and it was different than this one, where it does say Parachute 505th Infantry. It does have a panther on it weaving downward, and it has the words H minus, because H hour is invasion hour. The paratroopers go in at H minus before the invasion hour. Now this was a CG4A glider, and when they were incorporated into the parachute outfit, the paratroopers did not like this. And they said, we're paratroopers, and the old emblem was just fine for us. We don't need to have any baggage. The, the men that rode in gliders did not get any money like paratroopers did. They didn't get $50 a month. They didn't get any extra benefits. They didn't get to wear parachute jump boots. They were just basically infantry soldiers, and their glider wings had, I'm sorry, their glider wings had a G in the center of them. And everybody said that the G stood for guts, because it took a lot of guts to get in these gliders. They were made out of tubular steel and canvas. There were 6,600 produced in World War II. There are only five left in existence to this day. They, most of them did not land, they crashed. But the paratroopers didn't like this, so what they did was they took a blue ink pen and they went over all the parts of the glider so that the only thing you could see was the white parachute. And they had to turn around and the commanders had to issue a statement that this emblem is not yours to do what you want as you please. It is a part of the United States Army and it will not be modified. This was Slim Jim Gavin. And I was very close with his daughter, Barbara, up until she suddenly died in two years ago, Christmas. And I still can't erase her emails, her text messages to me, her cell number. It was, we were so close. But her father, I actually presented her with a copy of his book and it was serial number 82. And it was only fitting that it would go to her. Now, up here, this is 3rd Battalion Headquarters Company. There's my father, there's his best friend standing next to him, Mac McIntyre. And also, these men, you see a lot of them here. If you look closely, 
They don't have any parachute dumplings. He doesn't. He doesn't. He does. He doesn't. He, uh, he doesn't. They were cooks. But they wanted everybody dressed the same. It was a show of force. But they weren't paratroopers. And, of course, the paratroopers didn't want the cooks in the picture. So there was another one. The, the fights and the arguments, you know, they, there was a roadhouse in Georgia. The paratroopers, a couple of them went in the roadhouse when they were on leave. They were treated very badly by the patrons and by the, by the person who was the proprietor of the roadhouse. So when they went back to the camp, they told everybody what had happened. <coughs> the next time Lee came up, they said, well, we're just going to have a mission where we're going to go down and pay the roadhouse a visit. So when they were in the process of leveling this roadhouse board by board, the sheriff showed up, the military police showed up, the sheriff blasted a double barrel shotgun in the air, and they, a bunch of paratroopers were rounded up and hauled into the jail, and Colonel Gavin went down to get them out, and he said to the sheriff, this is a military matter, he said, this should be handled by the military, and these are elite paratroopers. They shouldn't be sitting around in a jail waiting for charges. And the sheriff said, you have the audacity to call this band of lunatics elite? He said, they're nothing more than a bunch of organized and war lackers. And I always look for the definition of that. And I think what you'll find is the 505 paratroop. <laughs> But they were the toughest thing on the face of the earth, and they wanted everybody to know it. This was Max, the jumping dog. He was the only dog that was a qualified paratrooper in World War II. And when he was, when the men were going on a training jump, he was running after the men, running around and barking wildly as they were getting in the airplane. And Max's handler went to Colonel Gavin and says, I think he wants to jump. <laughs> And Gavin says, paratroopers are strictly volunteer. He is not to be thrown out of the airplane. <laughs> and Max completed his spy combat jump, his spy training jumps on his own and got his jump wings. There's a whole series of pictures in the book about Max. Now being that the 82nd was, this was their, uh, their newspaper called Static Line with their unit emblem, this is volume one, page one, and so on. And they were making such strides in, in, military, uh, in military performance in the United States that they were being noticed by all other paratroopers. And what happened was this started to become every paratroopers a uh, newspaper. They started to want it more than the, not just the 505 should have. It. But anyway, it goes on talking about their, their first newspaper and everything. And there are a ton of cartoons in the magazine, in the book. And uh, yeah, they said that paratroopers were womanizers. And that kind of started out with, Cur with Colonel Gavin also. Now, this man was in charge of Headquarters Company 3rd Battalion. His name is Major Krupps. Those of you that have seen the movie, The Longest Day, it was true we invaded France, it was true. We did have paratroopers there. What wasn't true was when Vandervoort got to St. Mary Police with half a second battalion, Major Krauss already had the bodies down. That was the second command he gave when they took St. Mary Police, was to get the bodies down, and find out if any of these guys are still alive. So the movie was not true to what had really happened. Benjamin Vanderford did break his leg on the drop, that was true. But so many other things in there weren't. There, wasn't, there was no Major Lance. They didn't use Major Krauss's last name because he was of German descent. And I guess Daryl Zanin thought it would have been a conflict of interest. <laughs> So, the 82nd, 505, and the 505 combat team and 504 combat team were so successful 
in their ground operations in the states and taking simulated objectives that the president had a hand in choosing the 82nd over the 101st and sending them to French Morocco, Casablanca, to support Patton in the downfall of North Africa. We were, beat, we were beaten very, very badly at Kasserine Pass in Tunisia. They were beaten to the point that the U.S. Army, before we could even bury our dead, the locals stripped them of clothes, and weapons, ammunition. It was just a free-for-all. And they sent Patton in there to straighten it out. And old blood and guts, as the soldiers used to say, it was our blood, his guts. <laughs> or our guts and his, our blood and his guts, I'm sorry. And, but there is a story, and I wanted to show this in the book, that Patton was a, a he was a loving person like anybody else, and he enjoyed a good time. Well, he had a little too much bourbon with somebody at, down at Fort Benning, and they took a baby elephant to a bank. Well, it wasn't pretty. The baby elephant made a deposit, and he <laughs> had to have the bank professionally clean. But um, there was a lot of fun in, in Pat, and he's always been looked down on uh, as being a warmonger. But they were, oh, I'm sorry, they were in. They were in Casablanca. They went to here to, to, to uh, a place called Ujda, North Africa. It was 120 degrees plus during the day, 90 some degrees at night. They couldn't train during the day. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't sleep at night. And they were, sorry. And then what the plan was, they were gonna get ready to go to Sicily. They would be moved to Tunisia, but the problem with being in Tunisia was, and there were trees in Tunisia, and there was shade and everything else. The problem was they were within, they were within reach of the Axis bombs. So it was not a good situation to keep them in Tunisia, but they went from Tunisia, and if you look at the, if you look at here's Tunisia, and there's Sicily, well, July 10th, we were going to have the seaborne invasion take place, and, the, and the, the ground elements were going to go off the ships, landing craft to the shore, and the paratroopers were going to go in July 9th, the night before. They were going to disrupt communications. They were going to blow radar sites. They were going to do all these things. So what happened was we dropped 1,700 paratroopers the night of July 9th, the winds kicked up to 35 miles an hour. This was their drop zone. They were north and east of Jalen, was where they were going to land. The British paratroopers would land down here. The 82nd would land here. And the, when the winds kicked up to 35 miles an hour, these guys were scattered all over the island of Sicily. By morning's light, some of them weren't even sure if they were in Sicily. It was so bad that at the rally point, out of 1,700 men, 188 showed up, 10%. They were told to expect the Italian army with lightweight French-made Grenoble tanks. They went head-to-head -head with part of Hermann Goring's Panzer Division with Tigers, the biggest tanks Germany had. Six hours of battle, we had 44 dead. And the enemy had a higher number of casualties and dead. And we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. This is my father in North Africa. He's wearing an M1942 combat parachute jumpsuit, just like I am. And the man that I showed you the picture of, it, uh, Major Krauss, when I jumped in Normandy, France for the 80th anniversary onto Drop Zone O, where my father jumped, the son of Major Krauss is going to be going out the door in front of me. We're going to be stepping into and rewriting history again. This was a briefing in the desert. Everybody's wearing combat helmets. Your helmet got so hot you couldn't even touch them. But it was better that your helmet got that hot than your head. This was Usha. 
not a tree to be seen anywhere. These big tents you see, these were all the officers in the mess tents. These little tents you see, those were all the pup tents of the men. Each man carried a half a pup tent. Now when they went to Tunisia, although they were within reach of the Axis Wampers, they had trees for shade. This guy's living a high life. I mean, he's got a place to eat. He's got a place to hang his gear. He's got, they got the tent, it's in the shade under the tree. I mean, this thing, life couldn't have gotten any better than, than that. But in Cambodia, with the temperatures getting that high, the men were fed beef stew. And the reason they were fed beef stew was it had the highest nutritional value out of anything they could have been served. And also in the book, there is the recipe, oh, that famous recipe for chip beef on toast. And we all know what they used to call that. And But this man is getting himself a manicure, and you can see the brass knuckle handle. These guys worn out for, they weren't a, a, a Sunday school choir. They were serious about their job. That's one of the parapacks under the airplane that probably helped them belt fed machine guns, ammunition, explosives. This was one of the load manifests from the jump in Sicily. Now you can see the plane here, but one thing you one thing you don't see on it are any of those white bands like you saw in the Normandy invasion. And after the battle of the Azzi Bridge in Sicily, they went to bury their dead. These are two pieces of parachute from the Battle of the Azzi Ridge in Sicily when command stopped them from wrapping the dead in parachutes to bury them. They said they're not to be used to bury the dead. They may be serviceable. Get these guys in the ground. As soon as you do, we're moving out. And how it hurt to bury some of these men without anything to cover them because my father, said when he buried Jim Daniels in a field grave, he said they couldn't, he couldn't throw dirt in his face. So him and Tom Daisy put Jim Daniels in the grave face down to bury him. But as I said, you don't see the white bands on here, and we're gonna talk about that, where they came from. This was the Azzi Ridge. This is where the Tiger tanks came out from behind this building. And they say even today, this bullet, this building is completely bullet riddled. And uh, it's on private property. This is one of the Tigers that was knocked out. And they did it at point blank range with a pack howitzer, an 88 millimeter pack howitzer at zero range. And that's how they took the, the Tigers out. This man was Private George B. Harry. He was the first 82nd Airborne Division paratrooper who was killed in action. The family didn't even know it until they contacted me and they read the book. And they said, that's our uncle. And I said, he was number one. The 82nd Airborne Division didn't even know it. Now, after they took Sicily, or at least after they took the southern half of Sicily, their objective, you had one General, one British General Montgomery in the east heading for Messina. You had Patton coming up the center, who was a showman. He was racing British General Montgomery to Messina because Patton wanted to get there first. Over on the left, you had Omar Bradley, and I think it was Third Army Group coming up on the on the east side of the on the west side of Sicily. And what had happened was. His left flank was open, and he didn't want his left flank open. So guess what? The 82nd Airborne Division ran 150 miles in six days with equipment, and there was some truck transportation, but most of the equipment got to ride. The men got to walk, and like my father said, he said, we walked and we ran just like everybody else. We just did it first. So the business of why would why would you want to walk to work when you could ride when he was signing up, 
he said, didn't actually play out too well. So they were taken, after the Sicily operation, they were taken back to French Morocco, uh, or at, back to French Morocco, to Ujda. And those pictures of this in the book, actress Frances Langford and Bob Hope came and did a USO show with some other members of the USO troop to entertain the men from the 505 combat team. Francis and I became unbelievably close friends. And I was the only person that ever interviewed her about this. And she said the worst audience I ever entertained in my life was the 82nd Airborne Division. And it went way beyond cat calls. It's in the book, and I won't get into that part of it. But being that that part of it was over, they were then uh, moved back to Sicily, and they were waiting for their next mission, which they believed was going to be Rome. And they found out that the Rome mission was going to be a trap. And the ground forces moved into Italy. The, the British moved in, I believe they moved in around here. Uh, the 82nd came in at, uh, at the Gulf of Salerno. And as they were pushing into Sicily, the Germans were pushing back. And it got so dire that General Mark Clark, in command of the ground forces in Italy, sent a communicate to General Bridgeway and said, request para immediate paratrooper support. Bridgeway sent a communique back to Mark Clark, said, where do you want them? Mark Clark sent a communique back to Ridgeway. He says, on the beach. Drop them right on the beach. So the second mission was the Gulf of Salerno. And they jumped right in here. And they jumped right on the beach. They were told, when you go out the door, don't look down. You're going to be over water. But the prevailing winds are going to blow you inland. And it did. And they landed on the beach. They then occupied the southern half of Italy. The 504 combat team went up to um, Anzio. And the fighting was so bad in Anzio, they were hung up there for over a year. Okay. When the southern half, Transfer in, my pay hasn't caught up. 
Vander Fortress looked at me and said, dismissed. So anyway, they were going to be moved from there to England, and they were going to be in staging areas. The 101st was brought over from uh, the United States, and there were 350 men who were not qualified to leave Italy that were 505 combat team paratroopers due to a little problem called venereal disease, and also uh, some of them had other, other issues that prevented them from not having a complete picket fence. You had to have a complete picket fence in order to leave the area and go to the next country. So they were held behind, they were put in rebel depots, and then they were moved into the 101st Screaming Eagles because the 101st had no combat experience. And as we all know, if you set somebody up to fail, they will fail. So they needed to give them every bit of experience they could. In England, General William Lee, who was the father of Airborne, was still in command of the 101st when he suffered a heart attack. That ended William Lee's career in the military. So they took Colonel Maxwell D. Taylor promoted him to general and put him in charge of the 101st Screaming Eagles. So he was combat ready and he was combat qualified. Now they were getting ready to go into, they were getting ready to go into Normandy. Now this is an artist rendering of my father the night he went into Normandy. He blackened his face, his neck, the back of his hands. He had so much explosives on him, ammunition, white phosphorus, composition B, plastics. He took the detonators out of the anti-tank mines he was carrying. He had nowhere to put them. So he mounted them on his helmet. Everybody started laughing at him for what he did. And he said, go ahead and laugh. They detonated. I lay there with my legs blown and I was suffering. He said, this way, if they detonate, it's over. <laughs> and they were getting ready to load into the planes. They were getting ready to load into the planes. They were in the hangar. General Gavin released the squad of assassins. There were 30 of them. They were actually the first people to touch ground in occupied France. They were to blow radar sites. They were to protect the drop zones for the pathfinders of the 82nd Airborne Division and eliminate any threat to the operation and do it silently. When Gavin released the pathfinders, he walked into the hangar and he stopped my father, Johnny Panko, Mac McIntyre, uh, Bill Shattuck, I can name all those guys. They were all standing there. And Gavin said, is this headquarters company, 3rd Battalion? My father said, yes, sir. We're Bell Fed Machine Gun Squad, headquarters company. Gavin looked at them and he said, tonight you'll embark upon a mission that our people and the people of the free world have waited for over four long years. Assemble is the largest invasion force that this world has ever known. You were to spearhead the landing of the invasion of Normandy, France. Your objective is to take and hold, at all costs, the city of St. Mary Place, roadblock the major highway, and stop any and all enemy reinforcements from reaching the beachhead. I cannot begin to tell you how important this assignment will be. This mission will not be an easy one. I know you'll do your job, good landing, good fighting, and above all, good luck. And he walked away. Now, the 505 combat team was so seasoned, and they started out under Colonel Gavin, who was now general, who promoted up to general in Italy. Gavin knew that if they had no commanders, they would accomplish their mission. And they were to the point that if they, if they went into hell, they were so bad, Satan would have left. I mean, they, you weren't going to tell a 505 combat team paratroop or anything. Trust me, especially his son could not say a word. Dad, I felt the love. But anyway, they headed to the airplanes. And when they did, one of the paratroopers started, they were getting ready, they were getting all the equipment on. There wasn't any communication or talking or laughing or anything because they were getting ready to go. And they were all loaded down with explosives. And one of the guys started to recite one of the paratrooper poems that was that was, um, there was blood on the parachute, there was blood on the ground, there were great big puddles of nothing but blood all around. 
and it goes on and on about the life of a parachute, paratrooper. Now this man was one of the two paratroopers who hung from the church in St. Mary Blaise. He was 17 years old, his name was Ken Russell. He just missed the spire. John Steele caught it, Ken Russell caught the lower part of the church roof. This was Donald Janata, killed in action, Battle of the Bulge. Prisoner of war in Normandy, escape, Battle of the Bulge. He died of wounds. This was Donald Keith, smiling young guy, a lot of fun. This man, he's bulky low, he's ready to go into combat. I don't think this man knew the picture was ever even taken. Far away looks from home. That was uh, Captain Kirkwood in charge of the 3rd Battalion Headquarters Company. This is the intern card from the prisoner of war camp from Donald Keith. Somehow he got his card out of the prisoner of war camp and he got the best Christmas present ever when he went under the wire of the Stalag fence and jumped on top of a box card and wrote it out of Germany. That is the real John Steele who was portrayed by Red Buttons. This is the church in St. Mary Police, and that's actually the spire that he caught, not this one. And that's actually the lower part of the church roof Ken Russell caught. Ken Russell was 17 years old when he watched his entire stick get annihilated. When he was in the airplane before he jumped, he said, I should be graduating with my high school class tonight. I'm 17 years old. This was a CG-4A glider. General Gavin said, or Colonel Gavin said at that time, he said, any man that rides a glider to combat will find religion. And it's very descriptive in the book of the, what happens to them. This was, uh, names, that's Claude Campbell and Clarence Erickson. Claude Campbell killed in action in the Battle of the Bulge. This is one of the handwritten notes, situation critical, being attacked, attacked from the west and north to south, request air support, immediate, straight house, west of mine, signed Mollet. They signed, a, a, all these handwritten messages were signed, but there was no rank. In case it fell in enemy hands, they didn't know if a private wrote it or a commander ranking general. Then, the Holland operation. They were gonna go and take the bridges in Holland. The Sun Bridge was to be held by the 101st. As soon as they got on the ground, the bridge was blown. The whole timetable was knocked off. The next one was the 82nd jumped at mile marker 48. Well, the 82nd said, if the 101st is jumping at mile marker 8, why don't they jump at mile marker 48? And we'll jump at mile marker 8 because we've been doing this a long time and we're really sick and tired of always being in the front. But in this operation, because it was British, General Urquhart, General Urquhart went in to Arnhem with 10,000 men, 8,000 British, 2,000 Polish paratroopers. He evaded when, they, when the ground operation failed and only reached the 82nd. He, General Urquhart evaded and turned command over to General Colonel Frost because the British general could not be taken prisoner. When Frost surrendered to the Germans, he had less than 1,800 on feet from 10. The rescue arrived. There was a man named Eddie Huptishoven, who I became very good friends with, who said he heard a hellacious buzz. He was a 14-year-old boy in the sky, and he said he looked up. And he said the rescue arrived as the paratroopers started to go out the door of the airplane. This was Nijmegen, completely raised. My father's combat uh, commendation, from, signed by General Gavin for four combat operations behind enemy lines by parachute insertion. The Battle of the Bulge, he had unexpected December 17th. The Germans massed 200,000 men and King Tiger II tanks. They were moving to get to Antwerp because if they could take our fuel depot, they would be able to bring a political end to the war instead of an unconditional surrender. We stopped them. And Don Johnson, the one paratrooper in the Battle of the Bulge, 
there's a poem in the book, and I, I won't get into it, we don't have the time, we're running very short, but there's a poem in the book of Don's experience that he, re he said to me Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day, when I looked at it, this was like 2002, Christmas Eve. And Christmas Day, I looked at the notes, and it went something like this. It should have been a silent night, a holy night. But something's gone dreadfully wrong with this fight. At 2 a.m., we were trucked 140 miles in a battle to do a tailgate jump in the waist-deep snow white. We're stuck in this frozen icebox from hell. Our Christmas spirit is not so bright. Soldiers die as the ground explodes in the middle of the night. Sporadic screams of agony are intermixed with the continuous echo of ordnance, fired and automatic from my left to my right. Muzzle flashes pierce the darkness as the paratrooper next to me says his prayers, oh God in heaven, will we see daylight? I look over as he slumps to the ground, the snow turns red. Next to me, his life's been led. My stare of disbelief and sorrow is broken as a trace of wizards past my head. With no time to mourn and great tenacity of purpose, I return fire instead. Sleep in heavenly peace, my friend. Sleep in heavenly peace. Memories of Christmas in combat, the Ardennes and Forest Belgium, dedicated to the memory of paratrooper Donald the Duck Johnson, who survived, and Henry Weistrack, who perished in the Battle of Wolf. And this was where the 101st was hung up in Bastogne. We stopped them. The war was collapsing, it was ending. The German 21st Army surrendered to the United States Army. They wanted to surrender to the best of the United States Army. 144,000 enemy soldiers surrendered to 11,000 paratroopers. What a mess. This pile of weapons, eight millimeter Mausers, my father said, you'd get them off into the road, into the field, try to disarm them, he said, they would be, before you could stop them, he said there would be a pile of weapons over the top of your head. The concentration camp they liberated, Wolverine, and it was so bad. There were no crematoriums, there were no gas chambers. The people were simply allowed to slurp to death. This man collapsed on his way out of the concentration camp. He wanted to walk out. It never happened. There are many, many graphic pictures of this in the book. The 82nd Airborne Division, General Gavin, told the, the women of the town of, of Ludwigloss, I want 200 brand new white sheets. Don't plan on getting them back. They made every man in the town dig four rows of 50 graves and had the men go to the concentration camp with the paratroopers, bring back 200 at least decomposed bodies, and bury them on the palace lawn. And a woman said, to to Gavin, why are you doing this to our beautiful city? And Gavin said, so you explain to your children, and your children explain to their children what you allowed to happen four miles from your home. My father's jump wings, four stars. The war ends. VE e. Day finds 505 in combat. It was only fitting that the victory in Europe was announced, the Germans signed the armistice of surrender, and the 505 was in combat. Now this, and every one of you veterans, I'd like to leave this with you, and especially I'd like to leave this with the wives of the veterans, because there was no medal for you, just as there was no medal for my mother, who tried to keep things together with my father, and I wish this poem is in the back of the book, it's flat lengthy, I won't get into it, but it did start out with, when bugles sound their final notes, and bombs explode no more, and we return to what we did before we went to war. And it's mad, it talks about going home and not being on the front page of every newspaper again. But this was my father at his picture day. My mother said, look at him, he was looped. You know, you know self-medication was very popular at that time. But when all of this came, all of this that I wrote in the book, when it was going to become a part of the official history of the United States Army, I wanted to send these men down the road, who I got to be so close with, all of these men that my father was close friends with, and I wanted to send them with a part of me what this did, knowing them and being 
so close with them as friends until their passing. I wrote, I have nothing but the highest respect for these extraordinary men who were to find themselves in a situation that was far beyond ordinary. They were brought together under this great nation and asked to fight in some of the most adverse conditions that a man could have ever been asked. What they had sacrificed was for all of us who would never have to go to war. They had accomplished their every mission and no taken ground was ever relinquished. The greatest achievement in my life was I was able to stand in a realm of honor with some very brave men who I will always call my friends. None of that would have happened if not for the writing of this document. They are only gone if they are forgotten as a tribute, not just to my father, but to all the paratroopers who answered the call of duty, for they endured and witnessed the devastation of battle. They bore the scars and the memories for a lifetime. Oh, say the sad, sad star. Spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. These men were the brave. Well, I think I got a little more on the way to start. We, uh, we do have books, and all the books that I have, they are signed, they are serialized. Uh, we take cash, credit, debit card, and uh, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, they're $140 a copy with them. I'm selling them signed and serialized for $69.95 plus local tax. And I give everybody the same guarantee I've given everybody in 10 countries. If you don't like the book, call me. I'll buy it back. We haven't bought one back yet. There's some guy, man in California, has two used copies for sale in a bookstore. He wants $639 for one and $600. 89 for the other. When I mentioned it to my sister, who happens to be sitting in back. Right here. Right here. When I mentioned it to my sister, she says, maybe he's seen something, you're not. <laughs> but we do have four movie directors looking at this book right now. And they think it may blow Band of Brothers clean off the screen if somebody wants to throw the $350 million into it to produce it. Hey, anyway, again, I'm sorry I rambled on. I'm going to turn it back over to Mike. Uh, I think we have time. I think we have time if uh, there are a couple questions. And I will also want to remind everyone that we're going to Bernard Brewing on Main Street. Uh, if you'd like to have a beer with Steve and some of us from the museum, uh, you'd be much welcome. Any questions? Quick questions for Steve? I have a comment. My squadron was a fighter of poets in that day. It's one that I ended up with long after they were fighting. They were black men. There, there is a pretty lengthy description of what it's like to sit in that glider. It was tubular steel and canvas. He bounced around for two and a half to three hours in the middle of the night behind the tow plane and then be released into pitch blackness into an unknown airfield if it was an airfield. And the glider pilots used to say, if you don't like what you see out the windshield, close your eyes, it's going to be over shortly. So my sir, my hat is off to you. And I think you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes? Did your dad tell you these stories? How did you learn all this? My father used to relive this to me day in and day out. And the older I got, the more brash, I guess, would be the word, is the way the description of how things went. Until I was about 16 to where there were no bars hold on any, I don't even think I was 16, I was probably 14. There were no bars hold on what he had to say about what had really happened. And like I said, you know, the execution of two paratroopers in Fort Bragg and everything that had taken place and it was an unbelievable experience. I mean, to have sat at the table with Ken Russell and his wife Dorothy and drank beer, I mean, that's something that could never, nothing could ever replace it, nothing. 
And those are the things we need to remember. And, and I don't mean to preach, but you know, we do need to remember our museums. And because the reason we have museums and we have these things is so that history never does repeat itself. Even one of the, a girl I knew who was an author from England, her father was at the bridge in Arnhem. And when she was taking a second language in high school, she said to her father, what should I take? He said, take German. He said, they'll be back. They always come back, especially in time of depression. And uh, when he died, his name was William Ch Charlie, I think last name was, when he died, his request to his daughter before his death was he'd be buried with his mates at the bridge in Arnhem. Well, hey, no other further questions? Well, thank you, Tom, and we'll see you, I think you who would like books, we'll see you at the brewery, and like I said, they are signed, and they are serialized. Thank you again.